Oslo, home of the Nobel Peace Prize. In this city of peace, a man of war is on his way to court. They send me to court, I think, more than uh, 30, 35 times. His name is Najmadin Faraj Akhmad, but he's better known as Mullah Krekar. He's founder of Ansar al-Islam, a Sunni Muslim group listed as an al-Qaeda-affiliated terrorist organisation by the US, Australia and the United Nations. Osama bin Laden is a very nice Muslim, great Muslim, leader of the Muslims also. As we discover on our journey through Krekar's opaque world, there are many unexpected turns. Is he implicated in the murder in Iraq of Australian cameraman Paul Moran, a killing the Australian government failed to investigate? And does he, as the Americans and UN claim, still covertly run a terrorist network from here? What was the connection between you and Al-Qaeda? There is no connection between us. We haven't done anything. Charismatic, enigmatic. Krekar is a minor celebrity in Norway. This Kurdish Iraqi now insists he leads a quiet life as a refugee. Having beaten all terrorism charges, he's now fighting a deportation order that would almost certainly end in execution if he's sent home to Iraq. He has several times returned to Iraq uh, and his, um, uh, that is contrary to uh, the whole institution of asylum. So for that reason, his immigration status has been uh, revoked. Norway has a long tradition of providing haven for those seeking political asylum. But the government says Krekar has exploited the system and is a danger to the country. The second reason is for national security reasons and due to his, his uh, alliances or his work uh, in Ansar al-Islam and, and the future, the possibility that in, in uh, the future setting he might pose a threat to Norwegian security. The Oslo suburb of Grunland is home for migrants from Pakistan, Somalia and Iraq. It's also Mullah Krekar's neighbourhood. And it's here, outside his apartment, that we first meet. Hello. Mullah Krekar, yeah, how do you do? Yeah, Mark Cochran. Kept out of view during our visit are his wife and four children, who now have Norwegian citizenship. The Mullah claims he relinquished command of Ansar in May 2002 because he couldn't control the group while commuting from Norway. Krekar is often accused of changing his message to suit his audience. A criticism only reinforced when he presents me with his autobiography, published in both Norwegian and Arabic. This is Arabic. Arabic. This is the yes. same book? Yes, the same. So you have two different covers here. This is the Norwegian and this is the Arabic Yeah, edition. that's right. The, the, this one, the Norwegian printers, they yes. use this. They choose the, this photo. Yes. And the other one, it's printed in London. But uh, I don't know why the man used this picture. Perhaps... Uh, uh, and this is from 9-11. Like, this is yes, a picture of an aircraft hitting the yeah, World Trade Center. Perhaps he liked this... Mm. Uh, and he used this. He's Probably certainly got plenty to write about. This is a side of Krekar few Norwegians have ever seen. The Mullah in Iraq rallying his supporters for the coming jihad. Just two months after the September 11 attacks of 2001. 
هروها دبي امكو ملا يچه لكار بزاوية كان اعداد جهاد بكبي كان بيشا خواه ما دكردن كم مجاهدو شكو پاره امكانياتي دارائي اگرته لم زماني امك لكردستاني امه دانا فرهمو تاك تاكي چه مسلمانان وكو دزنوش فرزا In the 80s, Krekar studied in Pakistan under radical Sunni scholar Abdullah Azam, who was also mentor to Osama bin Laden. After obtaining asylum in Norway in 1991, Krekar began commuting back to his homeland, the Kurdish region of northern Iraq. He dreamed of creating an Islamic state in the Kurdish region, which lay outside of Saddam Hussein's control, declaring there was only one punishment for those who criticised his interpretation of Islam. پیوست به فتوا و تنکا پیوست ایش به نکا آسایش و شرط پیان خوش یا ایگرین یا نایگرین من که بوم رکود ای کوچم با او حکمتش دعای من بکوچت و. Even today, faced with deportation, he remains uncompromising in his views. But you're calling for your followers to murder the man in the street or murder anybody who attacks Islam in the street. Yes, that's that's right. When, when someone be in the ministry and say something against Islam, everyone can kill him. Everyone can kill him in the Islamic countries, I mean. Krekar founded Ansar al-Islam to realize his dream. This Ansar video shows its fighters overrunning a village as they carved out a Taliban-style enclave. Human rights observers accused the group of numerous abuses. These victims, in Ansar's own video, appear to have been tied up before being killed. In late 2001, Ansar's ranks were swollen by jihadi veterans who'd fled Afghanistan following the US invasion there. Krekar says he created a unit of suicide bombers. In the years that followed, their attacks would slaughter hundreds of men, women and children. So you, you were training suicide bombers? You were training. Yes. And you regard uh, suicide bombing as a legitimate oh, tactic? Oh, everything. Everything which it is, we can do it. Why, why it's is not different between uh, suicide bombs and using Kalashnikov. What's the difference? When you send the fighters to the death, what's the difference between uh, someone use only on-off or someone use uh, his finger? What's the difference? It's the same. By early 2003, the US military was in the deserts of Kuwait, practicing for the coming invasion of Iraq. In attempting to justify the war to the United Nations, American Secretary of State Colin Powell claimed that Krekar's group was the link between Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda. Baghdad has an agent in the most senior levels of the radical organization Ansar al-Islam that controls this corner of Iraq. Like much of the Bush administration's justification for the invasion, the Krekar Saddam link was never proved. The US was very eager to use that link in order to link Al Qaeda and the Ba'athist regime in Iraq. Since that evidence hasn't panned out, although there's still a number of people who believe that that still is the case, um, there is a certain amount of suspicion that's attached to evidence that the US is bringing. Krekar remains a sensitive issue in Washington. And today, no US official will openly discuss his case. One Ansar expert who can talk is Lydia Khalil, an Egyptian-born American terrorism analyst. She served in Iraq with the Coalition Provisional Authority, working closely with the Kurdish groups. 
How badly does the United States government, do you think, want to get Krika? I think quite badly. I think that um, a lot of people are very frustrated by what um, he's been able to achieve in Norway, just namely being able to stay there and operate with impunity. Accusing someone of being a terrorist is one thing. Proving it is extremely difficult. In March 2003, as the US invaded Iraq, Norwegian police launched this dramatic raid, dragging Krekar off and charging him with terrorism offences. A month later, he was released. A lot of the evidence that was taken um, about Mullah Krakar was actually from captured Ansar al-Islam um, operatives who were taken into custody by Kurdish officials. Now, Mullah Krakar's defense team later made it clear that these captured Ansar al-Islam figures had given their information under torture. So that was one of the main pieces of evidence against him they had come to, to find out was extracted under torture and therefore inadmissible in Norwegian court. Krekar was free again. But the United States was still determined to get its man. In April 2003, a CIA officer reportedly checked into this Oslo hotel, not all that far from Mullah Krekar's apartment. According to Italian investigators, this same officer had, just a couple of months earlier, participated in the kidnapping, or extraordinary rendition, to use Washington's terminology, of a radical Islamic cleric then living in Italy. This time, however, things didn't go quite to plan. One of Mullah Krekar's lawyers says he received a tip-off from a source inside the Norwegian government, warning that his client should be extremely careful. It was apparently advice well heeded. Not long after, the CIA man and a number of other American spies quietly left Norway empty-handed. What happened? You're still here. Yes, of course, I don't know, because... Uh... I believe that God uh, decided our age, decided everything for us. That attempt failed because apparently somebody tipped him off in terms of the CIA's presence there. Nobody knows exactly who did it, um, but the CIA officials, of course, deny this. They say that they were there just to aid the Nor Norwegian prosecutorial team um, in their case against Mullah Krakar. And what would be the fate of Mullah Krekar, perhaps, if he'd been uh, placed in U.S. custody? Well, most likely he would have probably been sent to Guantanamo to be interrogated and then prosecuted later on. Fearing further kidnap attempts, Krekar now lives under a kind of self-imposed house arrest only venturing out for court sessions and Friday prayers. He has few friends in Oslo. His supporters in the peace movement have faded away as details of his past have emerged. And Krekar is feared by many in Norway's Muslim migrant groups. I think that uh, some uh, political groups, when they didn't success against me in the court, they try to move the society against me. The Mullah insists he now offers only spiritual guidance to his followers. Others claim he's still active behind closed doors. <laughs> Ansar al-Islam, now also known as Ansar al-Sunnah, still contributes to the anarchy that is Iraq. Routinely wreaking havoc with suicide car bombs. In December 2006, both the US Treasury and the United Nations declared Krekar an Al-Qaeda facilitator, stating that he was still covertly financing Ansar 
through a European network in Germany and Bulgaria. This is the sixth years I'm in my home. I didn't travel to to another towns in Norway. How they say that I went to Germany and to Bulgaria and I sent money from these countries to Iraq? They haven't done anything. The US Treasury also claims he is active as a recruiter and still commands fighters in Iraq. I know what is stated publicly, and that is that they, he is responsible for sniper teams in Iraq who they claim have publicly declared their loyalty to Mullah Krakar and saying that he is their public, publicly that he is their leader and they are answerable to him. Still? Still. Does Norway believe that he is still head of uh, Ansar al-Islam? Well, I can only refer to, to uh, what Mullah Krekar has said himself about uh, his position in Ansar al-Islam, and uh, uh, we don't exactly know at what time or what stage uh, he has left the organization or what his formal position is at present. Given the intense scrutiny of Krekar by Norwegian and US authorities, there is one incident that oddly seems to have been ignored by investigators. In March 2003, ABC journalist and foreign correspondent reporter Eric Campbell and freelance cameraman Paul Moran were in the Kurdish region covering the opening days of the Iraq war. The previous night, the US had launched a cruise missile attack on the Ansar enclave. The ABC team was with Kurdish fighters, known as the Peshmerga, at a nearby roadblock. This is now the front line against Ansar al-Islam. The remnants of the Islamic fighters are just a kilometre beyond this trench. There's been machine gun fire in the past few minutes, but Kurdish troops have completely surrounded their camp. If the Peshmergas have their way, they have just hours to live. Not far away, an Ansar suicide bomber was preparing to strike. Who is this man? He is from Saudi Arabia. His name is Yasin Bahar. He came to Ansar al-Islam. He bought the car. They did suicide bombs. And uh, he paid the money which he had, about $5,000 to the Kurdish friends. And he changed his shoes also. It was new. He changed with another one, old, Shoes. This is before the attack. Before he, yeah, he, he started after that. We suddenly saw um, some Kurdish soldiers to our left who just ran across the road. And Paul, who was still filming, instinctively followed the action and he walked across the road after them, still filming. And then a car pulled up beside the soldiers, stopped and it exploded, uh, just without warning, it just stopped and exploded. Paul Moran, at least five Kurdish soldiers, and the bomber died. Dozens more, including Eric Campbell, were wounded and rushed to hospital. Before the ABC assignment, Paul Moran had once worked as a cameraman for a pro-Kurdish anti-Saddam TV station, funded by the US government. Later, some Australian press reports speculated that he'd been deliberately targeted. At the time, Krekar was back in Norway, having allegedly relinquished command of Ansar. He insists the suicide bomber's target was the enemy Kurdish soldiers, not the ABC crew but he makes no apologies. 
how he knew that this man is Australian and he is photographing only, he don't know anything and he is innocent. He came to kill this line, which is in this line. It is military line. He cannot uh, choose and your friend is, he stop or he, phot he photographing with the, with the other uh, soldiers. I think it is uh, when, like you say, does Muslim not say this, but you say, you say it is the wrong time, wrong uh, work in the wrong time. I think in Norwegian people say this, you stop it in the wrong time. One week after the suicide attack on the ABC crew in 2003, the Australian government formally declared Ansar al-Islam as a terrorist group stating that Ansar had almost certainly been responsible for the murder of Paul Moran. Mullah Krekar was listed as an Ansar leader in that statement. But in 2005, Australian authorities said that Mullah Krekar was now disassociated from the group, with no further explanation given. As far as we can ascertain, there has never been any Australian investigation into the death of Paul Moran. Nor has any attempt ever been made by Australian officials to question Krekar over possible links to the suicide bomber. He came from an organisation that you created, uh, that you trained, that you helped organise. Do you feel that you take any responsibility uh, for this? If there was something against me, Norwegian people or Australian people, John Howard can send also some some people or some papers, some letters to court in Norway, he can say that, yes, Mullah Krekar, you can ask him about this also. But when they didn't, no one asked me about this, it means that I haven't any contact with this. So what do you say to the widow of Paul Moran and to the other family members who may be watching this? I say, I say to the, all of the Western women, don't send your sons to kill us. Well, he wasn't killing anybody. He was yes, a cameraman. He was, he was also with our enemy. Well, if it is proven that he did have operational control of Ansar al-Islam at the time, then I think that his role in that attack should be taken a look at quite closely. Would you set grounds for, uh, for extradition to, to Australia, perhaps? <laughs> that I don't know. I mean, I'm not as familiar with Australian laws as I am with the U.S. laws, but... Um, I think it's kind of our responsibility within the counter-terrorism community to really pick a fine-tooth comb in terms of what he's been involved in, exactly how he's been um, involved in various attacks, and to really see, not just for our own benefit in terms of intelligence, but in order to, to bring certain issues to light and bring justice to people who've been affected by his actions through Ansar al-Islam. Krekar remains the target of numerous police and intelligence agencies. But one woman believes humour is the best weapon against the mullah. Comedian Shabana Rehman was born in Pakistan and raised in Norway. She specialises in skewering Islamic extremism, deploying burqas, nudity and body paint in her campaign. Hello. We can't confront fundamentalists in, in, in Pakistan. As a woman, I will get killed. But here in, in, in Europe, in, in Norway, we can confront them and we should do that. And because here we can experience, we can develop and we can uh, re-educate the fundamentalists to understand what freedom is. <laughs> Her actors prompted death threats and shots being fired at her sister's Oslo restaurant. But it's also increased her popularity and she now works the threats into her routine. I receive, uh, I receive a lot of dead threats. This guy, he wrote to me, you have to die, bitch. Someone like you will never be a good Muslim wife. <laughs> and you know what? I will never be a good Muslim wife because it has been a long time since I was nine year old. 
på spørsmål om Krekar er da... Shabana Rehman's most memorable act came on the night Krekar launched his autobiography in a nightclub. Her impromptu stunt would trigger a national debate on religious tolerance versus political correctness gone wrong. It was a really multicultural audience and... And people were, were afraid of this man and they were angry at this man and they d- didn't agree with him. And I just decided that we have to show him that we are not afraid uh, because the fear, the fear is giving him power as a mullah. So what if we remove the fear? What will happen then? And then, in a happy comic way, I just took around his legs and lifted it up. And he was smiling all the way up. I don't know what happened up there. The mullah was not amused, later filing a sexual harassment charge against the comedian. The case was dismissed because everyone could see it wasn't a, a, a sexual harassment I was doing. I was actually trying to help him to show that you're not a dangerous man. They did this against me like an Islamic symbol. And they tried to, to destroy this symbol, but so they couldn't. Undaunted, Mullah Krekar now fights his jihad online, running regular chat rooms and a web page. So you have replaced uh, the Kalashnikov with a laptop? Kalashnikov is also necessary in Kurdistan. Laptop is necessary in all of the world. In addition to giving spiritual advice, he encourages his followers to kill American and Australian troops in Iraq. If you say to me, Mullah uh, Krakar, I have a, a, a Muslim friend, he wants to ask you about jihad. Can he go to jihad in, a, in Iraq against Australian occupation? I say, yes, of course he can. Yes, it is jihad, and you can send him. He can go also, he can travel. If I, if I have money, I will uh, buy the ticket for him also. Because it is jihad. In this area, it is allowed for me in Islam to kill him, to kill his translator, to kill his, the people which give him a food, give him water give him medicine. All of them is in the line of the war. It don't mean that I can kill the soldiers, Australian soldiers will return back to Sydney because they left the zone of the war because it is allowed for me to kill Australian soldiers in Iraq. Krekar claims to have severed all links with the group he created, now known as Ansar Ultsuna. But the fighters still follow his doctrine. In this Ansar clip, posted online just two months ago, two kidnapped Iraqi government employees are accused of abandoning Islam. And in accordance with Krakar's beliefs, execute. Are you confident of a, of a win today? Today is Mullah Krekar's last chance. His final appeal against deportation is being heard by the Supreme Court of Norway. His case is causing Norwegians to engage in some soul-searching over their cherished ideals of asylum. Well, it's always been important for us to have a generous refugee policy. 
Yeah. The problematic side with Mulakreka is the fact that it sort of made us question uh, rather the whole institution of, of resettlement. Yeah, we must wait. Yeah. It's in the hands of the judges or God? We must wait. <laughs> Kreka lost this appeal, but he's unlikely to be going anywhere. Norway has a strict policy of not deporting individuals to countries that engage in torture or have the death penalty. Even one of his fiercest critics says he should stay. I think that he stays here will give him less power. Yes. And the democratic, humanistic uh, tradition more power. Mullah Kreka regards every extra day spent in Norway as a victory and a defeat for the Americans. He fights for the creation of an extremist Islamic state. In one sense, Norway, as a secular democratic society, symbolises everything he despises. Yet, ironically, the Norwegians' inherent sense of justice may be the only thing keeping him from the Iraqi hangman's noose. Big it's a big interval and a half of the